So just before we move forward and start talking about um, maps and uh, the, the map interface and hash maps, I did allude to a potential problem that could come up uh, when you're using the uh, compare to function or the compare method, I should say. And I just want to go through that briefly before we actually move on, as I said, to the map issue. So if you actually go ahead and read the Java documentation on the collections framework, you'll find that there's a lot of talk about it. Uh, and they use words like and ordering being consistent with equals. That's sort of their phrase. And much of the discussion doesn't do a great deal to shed light on what that uh, phrase actually means. And again, the phrase is and ordering being consistent with equals. But it really comes out to be quite simple. A method that produces ordering that is consistent with equals will only return zero if the elements being compared actually are equal. Now our compare to method behaves well in this respect. So looking at our compare to method, looking at our compare to so our compare to method here behaves well in this respect, as you can see on the screen there. So if two seat objects have the same seat number, then they are the same seat effectively, and the string .compare to method will return zero, and that's quite correct. But looking at our comparators compare method though, go back up to the top here. This is the compare method here I'm talking about. This is definitely not consistent with equals. So comparing any of the seats with the same price will return zero when they're quite obviously not the same seat because of course we can have multiple seats with the same price. So this causes problems with sorted sets and maps actually. If they're sorted using comparators such as ours, then that's inconsistent with equals. Now it actually turns out to be quite easy to fix. All you'd need to do is do a further test on the seat number whenever the price is equal, just as so I described for last and first names in the previous video. But I'm gonna leave it as it is for now so that we can see the problems that can arise with sorted sets and sorted maps uh, later in this video. So the bottom line is you can't use the compare method as we've got here without more work uh, using the price because it's going to be more than one seat that would return uh, an equals returning a zero because the price is the same. You need to break it down a little bit further. So anyway, let's move on now and start talking about the map interface. And again, you'll see an example of what I mean by this error a little bit later on. So right now we're going to leave the collection side of the Java collections framework uh, for now, and we're going to have a look at the map interface and also some of the Java classes that implement it. Now the map interface is part of the collections framework, even though it's not a true collection uh, as, uh, in the true sense of the word, as we've talked about in the various uh, images and so forth pr in previous videos. And just to show you what I mean, let's just uh, open a browser and paste in this link, which will also be available for you. So you can see, obviously, a map is out here on its own. It's not uh, part of the collection exactly, like a set, a list, a queue, and a DQ is. Now, the map interface replaces the now obsolete dictionaries abstract class, and like the class that it replaces, it maps keys to values. So a language dictionary is a classic example of a map, with the keys being the words in the dictionaries, and the values being, of course, the definitions of the words. Now, unfortunately, the, an uh, the analogy falls down a bit with the English language, and the reason for that is many English words have the same meanings. So the word put, for example, has four definitions. Two as a verb and two as a noun. Now a Java map cannot contain duplicate keys and each key can only map to a single value. So in the next few lectures, we're going to have a look at two of the Java classes that implement the map interface. And they are hash map as well as linked hash map. And as well as going and, talk and uh, looking at tree map that implements the sorted map interface. Now maps, like all the core collection interfaces, are generic. They take two types, one for the key and one for the value. Now it's, it is possible to use raw maps where the types aren't specified, but as we've seen in the lectures on generics, this isn't a good idea. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start with an example of using hash map to store descriptions of a few computer languages. So I'm going to create, I'll go back to IntelliJ and we're going to create a new class name. And notice I've still got the collections code are open. So for now, we're going to be using the same project, but we're just going to create a new file in here. So a new Java class, and we're just going to call this map. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a uh, public static void main so we can actually run our code. So we can do PSVM and press tab, and that creates the uh, definition for us automatically, as you can see on the screen there. So let's go ahead and uh, type some code in now. So we're going to start with uh, creating our map, our map object. So it's going to be map, I mean, using generics. It's going to be string for the key and string for the value. That's our definition. And we're getting an error there because I think I need to change my language level, but we'll see how we go. Languages equals new hash map, hash map. 
like so. And just looking at the error. And okay, I see what the problem is here now. And what I was going to do was restart the video, but I think it might be a better idea just to show you if you ever get into the scenario, uh, how to get out of it. So what I've done there, I've used the name map to be the name of the class, and I'm trying to add a variable called map as well. So what we can do there to get out of that, well, there's two ways. Firstly, we could just refactor it. We could just click on that refactor, rename. That's probably going to be the quickest way to re rename the uh, class to get out of it. But the other thing we could also do is we could do something like java.util.map and then we could put string string languages equals new hash map. We can do something like that and that will actually fix the problem. So if you do run into a situation again where you've used a reserved word for a class name, this is a way to get around it by actually typing in the actual name. And uh, by typing in the uh, you know the complete declaration, if you happen to know what the package name is, you can fix that. But with that said, I'm going to change this anyway because it's just going to save a bit of typing. So I'm going to refactor and rename. I'm going to call this map program. Press enter. And then I can actually remove this definition here at this point. You can just delete that. And Java will then come up and say, oh, did you mean this import? Java.util. Yes, that's the one. Okay, so moving on. So we've defined our map, we've just set, set with the two generic uh, parameters there, string, string, that's the key and the value. So that's the types and the objects we're going to be using. And then to add something, we just do languages.put. And we could start with good old Java. And we could say something like a compiled, high level, object oriented platform independent, language like so okay and let's add a few more so we're going to do languages dot put and again the first parameter there is the key so you can see if I leave that there so and the second is the value that we want associated with it so we'll type Python for another one and interpreted object oriented high level programming language with dynamic Semantics. Okay, and languages dot put our goal and uh, algorithmic language. Spell it be good. Algorithmic language, and we'll do a couple more. The first language I ever used, Basic. Yes, I'm not too proud to admit that. And of course, that's beginners all-purpose. Symbolic instruction code. That's what it's basic stands for. And one more, let's do Lisp. And we'll say Lisp. And let's say therein lies madness. Okay, so that's our languages. And that's now stored each one of those references, a uh, key value, key and value pair uh, into the map object. And I made a typo there. Let's just fix that up as well. So how do we get access to those? How do we retrieve them? Well, we obviously inserted them using the put. We retrieve them using a get. So we can type in something like uh, languages.get and we type in our key. So let's start with Java. And if we run that, I need to right click this first and run it so that uh, we run the new program. So it will give us an option up here to run. So I'm gonna run that first. And you can see that we've got a compiled, high-level, object-oriented, platform-independent language, which was clearly the setting, uh, the uh, value, I should say, that we defined for Java. So that's good. And obviously, if you wanted to get access to the other ones, you'd have to do the same thing. You'd specify that as the key, and by default, .get returns the value associated with that key. So that's good. But uh, one important feature of maps uh, is that the keys are unique. So in other words, if you try and use a value again, what happens is the new value gets overwritten. Now you don't get an error, but the the new uh, the old value I should say gets rewritten or re sort of overwritten I should say. So we could do something like this. We can put uh, languages dot put dot put. Let's put Java again. Java. I put this course is about Java. And now if we reprint that again after doing that change, if we run that. 
you can see what happened there. We didn't get an error, didn't come up and sort of say it already exists or anything, but clearly what's happened is it's overwritten the value. So that's the important thing to remember is that for a particular key, there can only be one value. And if you try and insert more than once, using the put more than once, then the value gets overwritten. Now the put method itself can be used to tell if a value is being added for the first time. It can be useful in certain circumstances to know that. Because, and the reason for that, it returns the previous value if there was one. So we can change these lines here to show you what I mean. Let's change these two here. And instead of just putting the language.put, we'll put a system dot out there. We'll surround that in that, like that. And we'll do the same for the Lisp as well. So we're now surrounding that in brackets. And if we just uh, comment out these briefly and run this again, you can see we've got the answer, the uh, return object was null for both cases. And what that essentially means is that this was a brand new reference. So a brand new uh, key value pair that was added to the dictionary. But again, if we now uncomment this again and run this again, and actually what I should have done is also, actually what I'll do is I'll comment these out. We don't need to know that. That's just uh, a printout. But what I wanted to show you was this line here. So system out, we'll print out results of running that. You should find that because we've already added Java the first time on line 13, when we do it again on line 20, we should get a different response. So we run this, so we run this, and you can see what happens there with that printout. We actually get the version, the value that already existed prior to this uh, being added. So the line still gets processed. So on line 20, language not put. Uh, if we actually leave this line in, uh, out so we can print it, we will find, of course, that the value has been changed. So it's changed as you can see there, but it has returned what the previous value was. So that's just a way for you to determine whether if you need to know that uh, a value is being added for the first time, that's how you go about doing it. So that's obviously helpful to tell you what the previous value was, but it didn't prevent you from adding it. In other words, it still got added uh, whether or not uh, you wanted it to or not. So if you do want to determine uh, and then pragmatically only add a key if it's not already there, we can do that as well. The way we'd go around about that is we can use the contains key method to check to see whether it exists. So we could do something like this. I'll just delete that line now. And up here, we can put something like if languages dot contains key Java, I can print Java is already in the map. Else, and that's there where we could put something like our languages dot put in there again and fix up like that. So that would be a way to pragmatically ensure that you're only adding an item once and it's never going to be overwritten by uh, adding it a second time. And just to check that that, run, that works when we run it. Java is already in the map, has come up successfully and told us that. And just to be really 100% sure, we could also put something here. If languages dot contains key Java, Java already exists. Else, and we can just put the Java line in there. And obviously, it's pretty clear that that uh, should return uh, the normal message, the else here, because we've just created the map on line 12. But just to confirm that it does work anyway. And I didn't put a message there, did I? So I need to actually put a message there to say Java added successfully. Because of course, we added the code there on line 16 to add it, but we didn't put any message on the screen. So we run that again. Java added successfully. We've got the two nulls, which were relating to basic and Lisp. And then we've got Java is already in the map down the bottom on the, the line that's uh, on line 25. So that's how you go about doing that. Now, there's also another command, another method called put if absent. And that's only going to add to the map if the key is not already present. But that's really intended to prevent concurrency issues so that one thread does not add to the map only for that entry to be overwritten by another thread. So it doesn't help in the null case because it will happily overwrite keys with null values. Now, the other thing we can do is we can also remove items from the map. But before doing that, it's, it would be really useful to print out our map's contents so that we can check that items are gone when we remove them. Now, one way to do that is to loop through all the keys in the map using the key set method. And that returns a set of all the keys. And we're going to be covering sets in detail later in this section. So all we're going to be doing here in this code I'm about to write is looping through the contents of the set of keys. So what I'm going to do is just add some code and we're just going to go right down to here. And we're going to print out there and let's just add some uh, 
equal signs just to separate our code like so and let's go and use the key set method so to do to access that to print out all our keys and the values we can put for string key that's languages dot and it's key set and that you can see that returns a set there again we'll be talking about those what sets are and how to use them in this section and then we can do something like print out key plus colon there to separate it and then we just do a languages dot get and we pass the key and that's going to loop through the map and return all the values so let's just run that to confirm that it does work and you can see we got through and they all work fine and just in case you're wondering with the code down here on line 25 we didn't actually redo Java so Java has only been added once and that's why we've got that result there showing the original interpretation of Java because we've added some code to pragmatically check to see whether Java exists and then we only print a message we didn't actually update it so that's why that's still showing the original one but as you can see that's gone right through the list of objects printing out the key and also the associated values now if you looked at that you'll notice that there's no specific order there obviously the order doesn't relate uh, really to how we've entered them for the first time because we started off with Java which it still does in this case but basic obviously wasn't at the top of the list it was towards the bottom and basically it's just like an, there's no guaranteed ordering I guess is what I'm saying with a hash map so the keys haven't appeared either in the order we added them nor in alphabetical order and that's the thing to point out with that default hash map is that you can't presume that's going to the records are going to be returned to you or the objects are going to be returned to you in the correct order so I'm going to finish this video here. In the next video, we're going to continue on. And we're going to talk about uh, ways to remove items from maps and uh, look at some other uh, bits and pieces relating to getting the most out of maps. So see you in that next video. See you in that next video.